C'est officiel, le FMF 2020 sera virtuel. Du 4 au 7 novembre, participez au plus grand congrès de médecine de famille au Canada. Le FMF offrira plus d'une centaine de séances et ateliers de formation de grande qualité fondés sur les données probantes avec un horaire flexible. Le contenu restera affiché en ligne pendant 30 jours. Cette année, nous vous réservons d'incroyables plénières. Dr Carole Herbert parlera de la nécessité de trouver de nouvelles façons d'intégrer les données probantes dans la pratique, malgré le rythme effréné du monde d'aujourd'hui. Le conférencier professionnel Stéphane Meigan s'attaquera à des sujets difficiles pour inspirer en nous la résilience et l'excellence au moment où nous en avons le plus de besoin. Dr Yona I donnera ses réflexions sur l'année 2020, qu'elle voit comme le moment de prendre des risques dans la pratique. Durant les quatre jours de l'événement, vous aurez l'occasion d'explorer un hall d'exposition virtuelle pour vous informer sur les innovations et les outils en médecine de famille. Et ce n'est pas tout, vous pourrez échanger avec vos pairs dans notre espace de réseautage en ligne et discuter avec eux des questions importantes. Les tarifs pour participer au FMF seront beaucoup réduits cette année. Vous pourrez vous inscrire dès maintenant au fmf.cfpc.ca. Suivez-nous sur Facebook, Twitter et Instagram. It's official. FMF 2020 is going virtual. Join us for Canada's largest family medicine conference, November 4th to the 7th. FMF will offer more than 100 top quality, evidence-based sessions and workshops on a flexible schedule and they'll be available online for 30 days. This year, we're including some incredible keynote speakers such as Dr. Carol Herbert, who will examine how we have to find new ways to incorporate evidence into practice in our fast-paced world. Professional speaker, Stephen Megan, will tackle tough issues and inspire resiliency and greatness when we need it most. Dr. Iona Heath, who will share her thoughts on how 2020 is a year of practicing dangerously. Throughout the four-day event, You'll also be able to explore the virtual exhibit hall to learn about innovations and tools in family medicine. Don't forget to connect with your peers in our online networking space to discuss important topics. FMF is being offered at greatly reduced rates this year and registration is now open at fmf.cfpc.ca. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Hi everyone, I'm, uh, I'm welcoming you to the Practical Talks for Family Docs from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. It's part of our live clinical webinar series. I'm Mike Allen, I'm a family doc and the Director of Practice Support at the College of Family Physicians of Canada. With me today is Nick Pinlock, who's also a family doc, and he's the scientific editor of Canadian Family Physician Journal, the official publication of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. I'd like to start today with our land acknowledgements. We acknowledge that the lands that we are hosting this meeting on include the traditional territories of many nations. The CFPC recognizes the many injustices experienced by the indigenous peoples that we now call, in that we, in that we now call Canada, and they continue to affect their health and well-being. The CFPC respects the indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that, we, that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all attendees to reflect on the territories you are calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and continuing towards reconciliation. A few housekeeping items. Um, your audience, the audience will be phoning in today from Facebook or YouTube. You're on both platforms. You can pose questions uh, during the webinar and we will address those at the end. We'll also have some poll everywhere questions for you, which you can interact with. And I have some also a few um, 
uh, as typical for me, I guess, some silly slides that may relate uh, very indirectly to the kind of things we're covering today. If you're watching from YouTube, please submit your questions in the chat window. You'll need to be logged in to either Google or the YouTube account to do that. And if you can't see the chat window, you're likely in full screen mode. Um, if you're a Facebook user, you need to log into your Facebook account to submit the questions. And last but not least, if you're watching this as a live webcast, you're eligible for uh, one main pro credit. In order to claim your credit, you'll need to complete this short registration form and survey that relates to the topic. It's very brief. Um, and you'll see that in the chat window um, that you can download. Please complete this by Friday uh, at the end of this week um, uh, to get credits. Okay, now I'm going to move over and uh, start our talk today. Um, and what we'll do is you can see us celebrating. This is the 10 most impactful articles from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. We wait until the summer to do this one because we want to give good time to allow for um, articles that were published late in the year in December to actually get noticed and get downloaded. So that's what you're going to go through today with us. Okay. Um, of course, we start with our disclosures. So uh, I work for the College of Family Physicians of Canada. I previously worked for the University of Alberta and I still get some things from them. Uh, like access to the library because I'm an adjunct professor there. And lastly, I do locums. I've received research and speaking fees and grants um, from a variety of nonprofit sources and been involved in some randomized control trials, um, but never received uh, funding from industry. Nick, do you want to go through your um, conflicts? Sure, yeah. My name is Nick Pimlon. As Mike said, I'm the uh, scientific editor of Canadian Family Physician. And um, my primary conflict is that I'm a salaried employee in that capacity with uh, the College of Family Physicians of Canada. But I have no other relationships with uh, financial sponsors. I don't receive any grants currently. Uh, no speakers, honorary or fees, um, hold no patents and have no other conflicts of interest. Thanks, Nick. Okay, I'll just review our learning objectives. We want you to be able to identify the 10 most impactful articles from Canadian Family Physician from 2019. We want you to be able to describe the key findings of each article and identify practical takeaway messages. And we're gonna give you um, ideas of, of links and things like that in the article, um, useful handouts that are present um, that you could take to your practice. All right, I'm gonna get us started. And uh, here's one of my goofy slides. Uh, I'm going to ask you to think what this creature is because he suggests what we're going to be talking about next, which was the most impactful article from last year. This little guy with the with the big eyes is called a sugar glider. So we're <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, so we're going to talk about sugars and diabetes. So this is an article I knew uh, relatively well. I know uh, Noah Ivers who worked on this and um, Noah's friend. He does a lot of great work. And he got involved in a project with uh, Diabetes Canada to try and kind of summarize down to the key things for family physicians. The Diabetes Canada recognized that they weren't, they were having trouble um, kind of reaching a primary care audience with their guideline. So they wanted to include kind of a, a guideline about what is the key messages for family docs. So uh, what this group did, you can see they're mostly family physicians, med students, uh, one endocrinologist, et cetera. And they took a uh, Diabetes Canada guideline, which had too many recommendations and tried to distill it down. And what was their process? So they took the, the tome, that is the guideline of 38 chapters and 313 recommendations and had the members uh, choose the top 10 uh, chapters and the top 10 recommendations. And from that, they pooled those and they came down with 22 key recommendations. They then summarized those further and drafted key messages and the um, finalized, then they finalized the three key messages. So what are those messages? The first is to discuss opportunities to reduce the risk of diabetes complications. And what they're talking about here is the interventions that we can do, uh, glycemic control, et cetera, that our lifestyle uh, are advocated strongly. Um, so uh, diet and exercise, uh, blood pressure, lipids, uh, A1C, uh, and what what they um, they give a guide and a couple of tools that I think would be very helpful for anyone who is interested um, 
It's important to remember that when we're treating diabetes, blood pressure for looking at heart outcomes like mortality and stroke and those kind of things, blood pressure is at least as important as A1C. Um, another key message is the opportunity to ensure safety and prevent hypoglycemia. And this was a key thing because we see it in our patients. As we move the A1C down a little bit, we also increase our risk, uh, for, we increase the risk for our patients of hypoglycemia. So they talk about medication choices, the important issues around driving safety and other things, not just hypoglycemia, but hypotension. And they offer this target tool um, that's available on the Diabetes Canada website. Um, so they provide lots of, lots of good links there. And then the last thing is they discuss self-management goals and address barriers. Uh, one of the things I remember a, a talk from Victor Montori reminding us that to us, they're, the A1C and the health of our patients are kind of paramount. But for the patients, they come back and they haven't necessarily followed all directions, embrace lifestyle change, et cetera. And we wonder why aren't they doing this? But, but this is actually just a small part of their overall life. And life is complicated. So we need to provide them tools to help navigate some of that and also to address lifestyle issues. So this is, for example, what I provided here was a physical activity tool um, that's available through the, the article itself. Mm -hmm. So really an, an excellent kind of rundown of taking that massive, you know, large guideline with, with all of its chapters and condensing it down into three key things that are relevant for primary care. And that's mostly around shared decision making mm -hmm. with our patients. The next one is around vaccines. So I'm, I'm hinting at that with this. And I pulled this from an anti-vaxxer type website. This is, um, uh, you, you've either got to laugh at it or you're, you're going to cry. So it says vaccines are like time bombs. We don't know when the next one will maim or kill a child, which is ridiculous on the face of it. Vaccines do cause very, very rare harms, but uh, they also cause a lot of benefits, which Nick is going to talk a bit about in a minute. But uh, when, I, when I read these, I also like to reflect on what are the kind of things would also work um, in, in this kind of statement? Vaccines are like time bombs. What else is like a time bomb that we see every day? So the first one is playgrounds. <laughs> playgrounds are like time bombs. You could put that in as well. Trees, climbing a tree, um, playing around a tree, pools, bicycles, all of these things. And of course, the dreaded puppy. Um, is also. So when you actually start to reflect on any of these statements, they fall apart very quickly. Let's look at uh, our question. So Donna brings in her two month old son, Thomas, for her routine visit. They're hesitant about Thomas receiving vaccines. She's heard that vaccines are associated with autism. Uh, what percent of Canadian parents have some level of kind of vaccine hesitancy where they're nervous about vaccines? So um, please go ahead and vote. You can see in the top, uh, you can respond via poll everywhere. You can also text it in. Um, but we're interested to hear what you have to think. Um, Nick, when you had read this, what what kind of numbers would you have guessed at before? Because it's it's really a guess, I would say. Yeah. Um, actually, I probably would have guessed around a quarter. Yeah. So a little bit higher than the actual numbers. I live on Salt Spring Island, so it would probably be around 90. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not nearly that bad. There's a lot of talk about the island, but it's not it's not quite as high as uh, as people say. But there are people who are um, clearly nervous about vaccines. And there's a lot. One of the first articles we wrote uh, in Tools for Practice that got published in Canadian Family Physician years ago was on um, this whole thing around autism and vaccines uh, and 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 the Wakefield, um, what happened with Wakefield, et cetera. So. Uh, like a fascinating story there um, of misleading for financial gain and probably academic gain. Um, but uh, anyway, we can see that uh, 19 is kind of coming in at top. So um, let's move ahead. And Nick, you can tell us all about uh, this article. Sure. Yeah. The thing I'd point out to uh, to members of the audience is that I actually interviewed uh, Vinita Dubey and Cindy Chen, who are the co-authors of this uh, clinical review in a CFP podcast. So if you're interested, you can also um, get some of this information there as well. So the, the rationale behind the article was that uh, Canadian childhood immunization rates are actually relatively low uh, for developed countries. 
Uh, we have less than 95% vaccine coverage in children. Uh, and we rank 28th out of 29 affluent countries uh, based on a UNICEF ranking, which, which came as a bit of a surprise to me when, uh, when I first reviewed the article. And a survey of Canadian parents actually show that a very small proportion of parents are vaccine refusers, but about one in five are vaccine hesitant. And the reasons for their hesitancy are actually fairly wide ranging. One is a lack of confidence uh, regarding the effectiveness, the safety and the safety system that's in place to protect children. Um, complacency is another um, consideration. Um, because we've historically had fairly high vaccination rates, parents feel there's a low risk of catching uh, vaccine illnesses. And the other is lack of convenience. So the availability and accessibility, uh, getting to the family doctor, getting the immunizations uh, done. And there are a long, long list of other factors as well. And if you're actually interested in uh, digging a bit deeper, um, Eula Biss, who's an American writer, has written a great book called On Immunity and Inoculation. And interestingly, she was actually interviewed uh, yesterday or Sunday in the Sunday magazine by Pia Chattopadhyay. And it's a, it's a really great interview if you're interested in sort of understanding more deeply some of the reasons why parents are vaccine hesitant. So where, where do most people get their information from? Well, not surprisingly, most of them get it from the internet and mostly from Google. However, um, most patients look to their healthcare providers. Um, about two thirds of people believe their family doctor is the most reliable source of information compared to about a quarter who rely on the internet. So that means that we have uh, the opportunity and the privilege of shaping their attitudes and influencing them. So in the article, they provide some helpful conversation hints that we can use to address vaccine hesitant parents. Um, so one question that comes up is, do we still need vaccines as many of the diseases are no longer uh, here? So your child might never need protection offered by vaccines, but they'll need it for outbreaks that are still happening in Canada, like measles, mumps, and pertussis. Um, and the metaphor that they use is, think of them like seat belts. Um, you know, the likelihood that you're gonna be involved in a car accident is low, but you still wear your seat belt to protect you in the event that you're involved in one. Uh, another question that often comes up is about things like formaldehyde and, and other components of the vaccine. Um, and formaldehyde is used as a preservative. It's naturally found in, in other things, especially foods. Um, in fact, a pear has more formaldehyde in it than all childhood vaccines. Um, and they provide lots of other um, helpful conversation hints, uh, almost a script. The article also provides some really helpful sites and links for clinicians and families, such as the Canadian Pediatric Society for both. Great. So the, the third article um, that was in the top 10 list was the uh, Managing Opioid Use Disorder in Primary Care, and this was from Peer. This came to Peer as part of a uh, granting agency and some organizations that wanted peer to address how how should opioid use disorder be managed in primary care. We had 11 um, uh, CPG members and like usual for peer, most of those are family doctors uh, and we only have one from peer actually in the guideline committee to try to try and uh, separate evidence review from from the guideline itself. It's a systematic review of systematic reviews to address the, the um, committee uh, the guideline committee members' questions. Um, so kind of a grounds up uh, question system. The first thing, of course, is can it be managed in primary care? And the answer is from, from a number of studies that found that uh, management in primary care resulted in better outcomes yeah. for OUD patients. Then it was the, how do you find patients in your practice who might have opioid use disorder that you've been prescribing for chronic pain? And some are, uh, you might reflect and say, some are really obvious, but some are less so. So there's something called the Palm Eye Tool uh, that we identified that can help patients uh, or help you identify patients who might have it. And it's asking questions like, do you ever take more, uh, it more often than is prescribed? Do you ever take more um, than is prescribed? Do you need refills sooner? Um, and some of the other questions are, do you ever use it uh, when you're feeling stressed or down? And, and that kind of thing, or, or to get a sense of feeling high. So, so it can be helpful um, 
useful. There was also a discussion of the um, uh, pharmaceutical therapy, so buprenorphine and naloxone or methadone. And uh, buprenorphine, naloxone, some of you will know it by its trade name, suboxone. Um, and what they found in the systematic review of systematic reviews that method and methadone may have a slightly better retention in treatment, but buprenorphine naloxone was uh, much easier to implement. So, um, and I'll show you some of the data for that. There's an idea that maybe cannabinoids can be used um, to help reduce OUD. The literature presently does not support that. There's lots of talk um, um, among uh, addictions medicine people uh, both ways, against it and for it, but we need clinical trials to determine the utility. Adding counseling to pharmacotherapy actually improved outcomes as well. Um, consider take-home doses. It was found that there was no um, harms from offering take-home doses, so that, that lends itself to the um, buprenorphine naloxone when they're stable. Consider urine drug testing. Um, as part of management, really not much evidence for that, unfortunately. One cohort study, but um, really felt by the committee to be uh, helpful in some patients, um, not for punitive measures, but just to kind of figure out what's happening for them. Uh, consider treatment agreements for the same reason, not for punitive. And the reason we keep stressing not for punitive is um, the research showing um, interventions where they had punitive measures to patients, where they reduced their dose or restricted their access when when let's say they found something in their urine drug screen, that actually resulted in worse outcomes for patients. So that was found to be a, a big a learning point for a lot of us, because uh, I had grown up from, if patients don't follow what you tell them, then you restrict their prescriptions, et cetera. And that, that probably doesn't help very much. Um, and remember that this is not a short-term thing. It's a long-term thing, the opioid and agonist therapy. And there's this graphic that forms a, a one-pager uh, front and back. So this is the one side of it. Um, and you can see it actually provides the benefit. So if you look down for uh, buprenorphine, naloxone, uh, retention of treatment was 64% versus 39%. So that's quite an improvement. I never needed to treat uh, better than four. Um, and you can see that, for example, the addition of uh, counseling uh, goes 74% versus 62% for retention and treatment. So lots of lots of good data here and then guidance on how to actually do it on the other side. So um, uh, useful, glad to see this guideline made it to the top. Nick, the next one's over to you. Sure, the next one is actually a commentary that, uh, that we published in 2019 uh, called Truth and Direct-to-Consumer Advertising in Canada of Ducrol for Travelers' Diarrhea Prevention. Uh, by Rudy Zimmer from uh, from Calgary, and uh, it's a really interesting story. It's a very detailed accounting of the authorization and marketing story of Ducrol in Canada. Ducrol is an oral inactivated traveler's diarrhea for ETEC or enterotoxigenic E. coli and cholera vaccine. It was primarily developed as a cholera vaccine, um, and the rationale for providing this sort of story is because we give a lot of it out in Canada. We account for more than half of global product sales uh, based on data from 2016. And it really doesn't work for what it's used most for. So there's about a 7% risk reduction for traveler's diarrhea in the vaccine prototype, so not the current product, uh, which is from 1991. And then there were two subsequent randomized control trials that actually showed no effect. The background is that uh, Health Canada apparently expedited approval in 2003 for two indications for cholera and for traveler's diarrhea, maybe based on the fact that there's structural similarity between ETEC and cholera toxin B subunits. And the National Drug Scheduling Advisory Committee in 2003 gave dual status. When used for cholera, a prescription is required, but when used for traveler's diarrhea, no prescription is required, so it's much more accessible. In 2005, a committee to advise on tropical medicine and travel called CATMAT, a clinical practice guideline. For travelers' diarrhea, they recommended that actually Ducrol was a very limited value and cannot be routinely recommended for the majority of travelers. In Europe, where it's manufactured, it's used only for cholera prevention only. And I guess the other piece of information is that the product monograph has not been updated to reflect this guideline or, or more up-to-date evidence. 
So although direct-to-consumer advertising of drugs isn't permitted in Canada other than via the U.S., direct-to-consumer advertising is permitted in Canada for, for vaccines, and that's what's happened with, uh, with Ducrol. So DTCA is happening. Patients are using the vaccine. It doesn't appear to be effective, and it does have potential harms. So some of the harms include abdominal cramps and pain, diarrhea, some of the symptoms it's actually used to prevent. Uh, there's cost, and it, it actually potentially takes away from more effective interventions. Yeah, I, I found this article a fascinating read, kind of a, an exploration of the journey of this this um, vaccine, and it's not it's not a positive story, but it's a fascinating one. Yeah, what was interesting was when we uh, we actually sent that out um, for review and eventually published it. I, I thought we would we would hear more from industry, but we we did not. So yeah, that's fascinating. Um, so we'll jump to our next one, which is. Um, the iron formulation. So several iron formulations are available to treat iron deficiency anemia. Older iron salts include ferrous gluconate and fumarate and of course sulfate. Newer ones are the iron polysaccharides or heme iron. When comparing these iron formulations, um, newer products are likely to A, be more effective than older formulations, B, be less effective um, than older formulations, C, be better tolerated than older formulations, or both A and C, which is they're more effective and they're better tolerated. So this is a, this is a huge deal around marketing again and the, the story around marketing. It's also a big deal because we, of course, when, when products get older, they don't show up in our drug cupboards. And we know that drug cupboards influence the way prescribing is done. Um, and so I, I recall um, in previous practice where the cupboard was absolutely filled um, with uh, some of these newer products. And um, we would see uh, drug reps for educational purposes. So if I had a resident, I would uh, potentially see drug reps. And this is probably 30% of all the reps that uh, I saw. Now, someone like me, they don't often come see. <laughs> but uh, when we would get some to come, it was generally around um, iron polysaccharides. We would after the encounters, we would discuss what was done to actually influence the way we thought. It was it was a bit of fun. Um, okay, so it looks like most people are saying they're less effective than the older formulation. So let's go ahead and look at what the actual research found. So this was from a tools for practice published in Canadian Family Physician. And it's actually with uh, Sam Moe and um, Alan Grill, and they're both uh, staff at the CFPC. Um, and uh, anyhow, so the our newer oral iron formulations like iron polysaccharides and heme polypeptides better than the ferrous uh, salt irons for iron deficiency anemia. Okay. There's a few studies, of course, uh, and maybe a little more than we thought, but iron polysaccharide versus ferrous fumarate, both at 150 milligrams of elemental iron in 80 patients. These were uh, mostly females age 39 or so in, in that kind of age range. And at 12 weeks, ferrous fumarate improved hemoglobin by 28.4 and iron polysaccharide by 6, so quite a bit less. It also, ferrous fumarate was better for ferritin levels, MCV, transferrin. It did cause more nausea, so this is an area that uh, we'll bring up as we go through, is, is the older irons actually causing more adverse events. The next study was one of pediatric patients, so these are 23-month-olds, so right around two years. They were given 3 milligrams. Um, per kilogram per day of elemental iron and either iron polysaccharide or ferrous sulfate this time. 12 weeks again and 80 kids. And what they found is ferrous sulfate did better at improving hemoglobin levels by about 10 more um, than uh, uh, polysaccharide. Ferrous sulfate also resolved iron deficiency anemia for 29% of kids versus 6%. The number needed to treat there is 5. And ferrous sulfate actually had less diarrhea. So in this one, the adverse events were less, if anything. Um, what about the other studies? Well, there are lots and some of them are kind of, are they really applicable? Like do blood donors count? And uh, because is that is that a medical problem? Um, but we decided to include all of them. Uh, so there's seven here. If you restrict ones with bad randomization, et cetera, you're down to about five. But anyhow, there's generally no difference in any of these different subgroups. And there are a lot of subgroups of patients, premature infants, dialysis patients, you name it. 
And only one study, these are underpowered studies. So only one found that uh, ferritin was better with the old irons and another found that there was more constipation with the old irons. So again, uh, now a bit conflicting again. So what are some of the limits? Well, they're underpowered, some of these studies, and one had uncertain randomization. They did per protocol. So they aren't perfect, but they do have a pattern to them. And you can see the costs, if you're looking at the older products, the ferrous fumarate and sulfate in their older formulations, they're five to $10 a month versus the other ones. And uh, so the older ferrous irons are likely the same or more effective, and they are cheaper. Adverse events were inconsistent to favor one over the other. Um, but if you had to guess, ferrous salt, the old ferrous um, sulfate, uh, gluconate, fumarate, they're the better choices. They're more effective um, and they're cheaper and probably have similar adverse events. Okay, Nick, over to you for shoulder injuries. Sure. Um, so the next article, number six, was shoulder injury related to vaccine administration and other uh, injection side events. So sh shoulder injury related to vaccine admin, SERVA, there's an acronym for everything, and <laughs> most of them I have trouble articulating. Um, so you inject into the shoulder joint, not the place of inflammation. So it presents similarly to a rotator cuff tear or bursitis, uh, but usually within two days of vaccination. It can be treated with NSAIDs or steroid shot. And this is actually the, uh, the infographic um, I don't know if we can, yeah, providing landmarks. So um, it's a nice little infographic. You want to sort of locate the acromion and then determine a site about two fingers width down from that in the midline is, is where you want to be aiming for. And it provides landmarks for, for when you're too high, for when you're too low, and when you're too far to the side where... Um, you have, there's a risk of, uh, for example, nerve injury like the radial nerve or axillary nerve if you're uh, um, too, uh, too low or, or if you're too far to one side or the other. Uh, they also uh, provide information about what happens when the uh, needle is too short um, and when the needle is too long in terms of uh, what the effects of that are. This is a really nice infographic for, for teaching learners like clinical clerks and, and residents in the, in the clinic. So that was number six. Oops. Yeah, and it was, you know, these infographics are gaining popularity and I think they're, <clears throat> they're pretty helpful. Like that is a very simple tool. Yeah. Okay, let's move on really quickly to our, um, to our next uh, uh, poll everywhere question. So this is Mira, she's 58. She's recently diagnosed with hypertension. You're reviewing her cardiovascular risk. And she states she is taking omega-3 supplements to reduce her risk of heart disease. So which statement is most accurate with regards to omega-3s? Omega-3s reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. Omega-3 supplements have no effect on cardiovascular disease. Icosopent is a pharmaceutical derived from omega-3s, but it reduces CVD. So is it both... Um, a and C, which is that they work that omega threes work in pharmaceutical or their uh, supplement form, or is it um, E, where they work, um, where the the omega three supplements don't work, but the drug product does seem to work. So just as a reminder, Icosopent is this new pro product that's reached the market is gaining popularity, and it's prescribed. Its marketing strategy is to prescribe it for triglycerides. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about it. In a, in a little while about the relevance to that in my mind, um, but uh, it's it's targeted to that. Um, so the answers um, uh, are E, uh, both uh, B and C, but we'll get to that uh, right away. So this is the top uh, studies relevant to primary care from peer. Uh, there are the top 10, and these are from 2018. So uh, you would have heard me talk about them, but uh, they were quite popular, so we'll have a quick refresher. There were three big uh, ASA studies in 2018 that, uh, for primary prevention that had over 45,000 patients and quite definitively show two of them found no benefit. One found 1% reduction in CVD over seven years, so virtually meaningless, and it was offset by bleeding harms uh, as a result. 
We've talked before, or there's been rumor about a cancer reduction with ASA that was not found at all, including um, uh, poly colon polyps and colon cancer. And one of the trials actually increased mortality. I think this is the, the end of ASA for primary prevention. Patients sometimes start them, but I recommend uh, for primary prevention against it generally. So diet types, this was the, um, the idea of low carb versus low fat. And then they also looked at genetic predisposition. The low carb was very low carb at the start anyway. It was kind of the ketogenic type diet. And uh, they found very similar weight loss for obese adults at one year. The difference in total was 0.6, which wasn't 0.6 of a kilo, which wasn't statistically significant. What is important to know is that the variance around patients was far, far bigger. In fact, it was um, gaining 10 kilograms to losing 30 kilograms. So if you compare, it's uh, their, the variance in weight gain or loss for patients in each arm of the trial was around 90 pounds over one year versus um, between the highest and the lowest versus the difference found for diet type, which was uh, one pound. So what really matters is can your patients stick to the diet? That's what matters more. It's not, it's not particularly diet type, unfortunately. There's no, there's no easy magic there. Um, at least in these two uh, interventions. So for treating, uh, the next one is for treating bothersome va uh, vulvovaginal symptoms in menopausal women. Uh, this 12 week study found that uh, using a placebo gel, just a vaginal moisturizer was uh, just as good as estradiol or the expensive kind of commercial vaginal moisturizers that uh, um, have things like Synvisc and that kind of thing in them. So it, it it really was reassuring to just try that first. Uh, I'm not saying that would be the only thing for people who fail it, but that's a good first step. Um, the next study was a, a, you know, another one in the nail of the coffin of opioid management for chronic pain. So this was chronic back and OA pain, pain about two thirds, one third. And they had a non-opioid management for pain uh, treatment schedule um, and versus one that introduced opioids far earlier. And what they found is that if you were in the non-opioid arm, your pain was either the same or better um, and function and quality of life were not different and opioid group had far more adverse events. There'll be more data coming out on this kind of thing, showing uh, similar things um, very soon. For women who get recurrent cystitis, it was found that increasing their um, intake of water uh, by an additional 1.5 liters per day reduced cystitis over the next year and not a little bit either. So the chance of having two or more cystitis events was um, was reduced uh, by 93% in one, or sorry, was 93% in the no treatment arm versus 12% in the treatment arm. That is very close to a number needed to treat of one. Um, so it's, it's a pretty dramatic intervention um, to consider when it's so simple. This, is a, this was two studies of omega-3s um, for CVD, cancer, and death. And again, 40,000 patients, neither found any benefit in any outcome. Now they did, uh, they also studied in another study if it improved dry eyes. Um, I thought that was a joke when I first heard it from a colleague saying that it's being marketed for that now or being pushed for that, not marketed, but pushed. And uh, I was shocked by that, but it also didn't work for that either. Um, but Icosopent uh, was used in patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It's the one we mentioned earlier. It's pharmaceutically derived from omega-3s, and it reduced cardiovascular disease with a number needed to treat of 21 uh, versus placebo over five years. Um, it did increase atrial fibrillation uh, for one in every 72, so that's a harm. We'll need to see if that's borne out in other studies. And it has a slight reduction in triglycerides, but I'll remind you that lots of drugs reduce triglycerides, but do nothing for cardiovascular risk or very little. And this is as effective as a statin, and this was added to a statin. So it's, it's markedly more effective than acetamide. It's even more effective than the biologics, et cetera. So I'd love to see another trial. There's one small one and one large one, uh, which is mentioned here, but I'd love to see another trial. If I was the manufacturer, I don't know if I would do one. Things are looking so good for them right now. Um, all they could do is maybe mess it up. So I can understand if they don't do it from a marketing perspective, but it would be lovely as a clinician to know for sure that this is real because it is a real uh, difference from what we've seen in the past with interventions added to statins. Treating pediatric fever, 
we've had trouble showing in the past that treating pediatric fever will reduce um, uh, febrile events. So, or sorry, yes, uh, seizure events. So what they did in this study, this was um, a study done in Japan where kids for some reason in that population have more recurrent seizures in a single fever episode if they get one. So what they did is they enrolled kids um, and give, gave them acetaminophen. I think it was suppository acetaminophen and then uh, follow them for 24 hours uh, with regular dosing. And what they found is kids who were given acetaminophen had less recurrent episodes of seizure in that fever episode. So that, that day or so. We don't know if it works the next time they have uh, fever, if we should start them right away to prevent the initial seizure or anything like that. But this is the first study to actually show that treating um, kids with fever who have seizures will actually reduce febrile seizure. So it's, it's a, it was a bit of a landmark and important for us. There's a great British study that looked at bath additives for eczema, and they really didn't make much difference, unfortunately, to eczema scores. Now, if your patients are finding that it helps their eczema, this was a pediatric study, but if the parents think it helps or the kids think it helps or, or adults think it helps, I'm not saying not to use it for them because they're feeling better in it, it's soothing. But uh, if you're counting on a change in eczema score, that, that hasn't been shown. Um, and the last one was a group looked at six different A1C uh, diabetes guidelines, and they found that they vary dramatically, with some recommending very low targets, less than 6.5, and some recommending um, very loose targets, kind of 7 to 8 or uh, for every patient. So, and what they found was that the lower the target, the weaker the evidence it was relying on, which was, which was interesting. But uh, they stress the importance of shared decision making, which takes us back to the very first article that, that uh, Noah had prepared with his team. Okay, that's a quick rundown of the top 10 studies. For that. <laughs> we had to go fast. Nick, over to you. Sure. Uh, number eight was a clinical review called Approach to Meniere's Disease Management. Uh, so just a reminder that uh, symptoms of Meniere's disease, which is uncommon, um, include recurrent vertigo attacks, usually lasting around two to three hours, but can last anywhere from 20 minutes to up to 12 hours, plus or minus nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, sometimes even diarrhea. Uh, and then the other feature is hearing loss, which generally becomes more prominent and permanent with, uh, with the passage of time. So the authors provide the diagnostic criteria in a nice little box. The definitive criteria include two or more spontaneous episodes of vertigo, each lasting from 20 minutes to up to 12 hours, as I said. Uh, documented sensorineural hearing loss greater than 30 decibels below and above 2 kilohertz. Fluctuating oral symptoms that include um, hearing changes, tinnitus and fullness in the affected ear. Uh, that's not better accounted for by another vestibular disease. Um, and the differential diagnosis includes uh, dizziness, if not vertigo, uh, the causes may be cardiac or, or otherwise, uh, BPPV. So Meniere's disease attacks usually last longer and are not reproduced by specific uh, position or, or head movements. Uh, vestibular migraine should be considered usually only though if there's a migraine history or other features of migraine like aura. Uh, viral labyrinthitis and other viral causes um, can be considered. Th in those cases, the symptoms last usually days to weeks, but they can also involve hearing loss. And then others on the list are rarer things like Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, acoustic neuromas, MS, or, or stroke. Uh, in terms of physical examination, they recommend checking orthostatic vitals using um, the HINTS exam to discriminate between central versus uh, peripheral changes, a focused neurological examination, uh, especially focusing on cerebellar findings and cranial findings, examining the tym tympanic membrane and pinna, for example, to exclude things like Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Uh, using the Dix Hall Pike maneuver and the Rinne and Weber test to a test uh, to um, examine uh, hearing acuity. In terms of investigations, they recommend very few things. Maybe consider doing a TSH. Definitely an audiogram should be done, and you should consider doing an MRI to rule out things like neuroma and MS. Um, most of these patients will probably be end up being referred to an otolaryngologist or a specialist. 
Um, and they primarily recommend conservative treatment. So counseling to reduce stress, reducing caffeine and alcohol consumption and reducing sodium consumption to less than 2.3 grams per day. Medications are sometimes used like beta histidine to prevent attacks, uh, diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide and uh, triamterine uh, to try and reduce the risk of hearing loss. Uh, and then other treatments are also sometimes used like prednisone for flares, benzodiazepines for vestibular symptoms, but these are, are, are rarely used. Uh, ENTs might offer uh, more invasive treatments like intratympanic mem uh, st steroid injection, uh, ablative therapies, things like endolymphatic shunts, uh, but these things are, are, are probably performed quite rarely. And then the final sort of uh, key thing is driving. So most patients with Meniere's disease can continue to drive, uh, except those with a, a rare form that involves sudden drop attacks. Um, but even in these cases, uh, patients can go back to driving six months after their symptoms have resolved. So not a common condition, but certainly one that I've seen in my practice. Um, and uh, I, this is a helpful guide to, uh, to assessment and management. Great. So what is the next thing we're going to deal with? This is a subtle hint of what we're going to deal with next. <clears throat> Traveler's diarrhea. <laughs> Subtle, like I said, like a brick, it's subtle. <laughs> now this next one is actually, uh, we start with a joke, but it is actually a really awesome infographic and, and uh, you don't really need to say too much about it because the infographic is so good. So if you're seeing patients who are considering traveling, uh, really think about pulling this out of the journal um, mm -hmm. because it's very helpful for patients. So it starts with the definition of what it is for patients so they know when they go away they can take it with them and say okay it's cramps all of these things lasting two to two to four days like, um, stomach pain fever bloody diarrhea all of that they indicate the countries that are most at risk or the areas most at risk and uh, they make recommendations based on that um, so who should uh, which which kind of intervention should you take with us and you'll see here um, that the vaccine uh, and Nick was mentioning earlier, doesn't make this list at all. And, and it focuses more on evidence-based treatments um, for patients. And it gives a good guide um, to you to when to use them and, and how to use them. Here's some of the other things they provide, things like washing your hands to make sure that um, you prevent the infections, uh, avoiding ice cubes and salads, that kind of thing. And they, they just have lots of good options, including the options for bismuth. But the problem there is the black stools and the taste and all of that but but many patients uh, will elect for that I have had patients choose that option sorry not many but some will choose it using bottled water and and drinking um, I remember one of my first trips ever uh, I couldn't get bottled water um, when I was in the back uh, areas of the Baja California and ended up uh, buying beer to brush my teeth with <laughs> which uh, was cheaper than anything um, and I was a very poor student. So uh, yeah, it, don't ever, ever do that. It's awful, <laughs> awful taste, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Um, so we were saving what little water we had for drinking and the beer for doing other things <laughs> like brushing teeth. Okay, so now on to what, uh, and, and what I liked about this guide was it also told you, you know, what interventions to do in kind of a stepwise fashion. So if your diary is mild, just consider loperamide. And if you, you know, as it progresses, then yeah, you use loperamide, maybe an antibiotic. And then as that goes on, you should use an antibiotic. So it's, you know, it's really um, a lot of great tools and when not to use loperamide. I remember uh, in my training uh, over 20 years ago, we were told not to give it in diarrhea because uh, in, in infectious diarrhea, because we were worried that it would cause the, the infection to to stew inside the abdomen for longer. So th this, we've, we've since learned that that's incorrect. Uh, it didn't take too long for us to figure that out, but uh, it's still not recommended when patients are, are very severely affected with uh, blood. And then it just gives some other advice of when to phone and when to use oral rehydration. So really not, not a lot to review here that isn't in the infographic, but it, it is a great uh, tool to pick up for your patients and, and it, it also guides you on what to prescribe. 
Okay, over to you, Nick, for our last one, number 10. Sure. So our last article was a, a, a practice tip from Pierre Fremont, and it's called Managing a Patient with a Sports-Related Concussion, a problem that uh, I, I think we see fairly commonly in, in, uh, in our setting. And uh, key recommendations include using uh, doing an initial assessment using a uh, sports concussion assessment tool, the, the latest iteration, the SCAT-5. Um, the diagnosis of concussion includes excluding traumatic brain injury, uh, associated conditions like cervical injury and migraine headache. Uh, and they point out that loss of consciousness, amnesia, or an altered GCS are not required for the diagnosis of concussion. And they underscore the importance of document, documenting both the nature and the severity of symptoms um, using the, that standardized SCAT-5 um, assessment tool. After diagnosis, uh, they recommend that, uh, you, that patients stop at-risk activities for initial rest and then a, a gradual return to both cognitive and physical activity. And cognitive rest and return to usual cognitive activities is, is increasingly sort of part of the recommendations for, uh, for management. Um, in terms of um, return to play recommendations and return to cognitive activities, they recommend um, that have asking patients whether all the symptoms that suggested the pre presence of a concussion have resolved. Uh, was a complete and unrestricted return to normal cognitive activity achieved without symptoms? Were vigorous endurance and resistance physical activities performed without symptoms? So they're recommending a, a graded return to, to activity. Uh, did the clinical exam findings confirm a normal cervical spine and neurological status? And last, is there a health condition, a previous concussion, or a context that could justify uh, an additional uh, delay in return to cognitive activity or to play. They recommend that slower is obviously safer in patients who are under the age of 18, especially if they've got comorbid conditions like migraine headaches or ADD or a past history of concussion to go more slowly. Uh, and if there is a past concussion, if there's a short interval between the previous one and the current one, to, uh, to increase recovery time and de de delay return to activity. And uh, there's a nice uh, summary figure included with, uh, with the article. Persistent symptoms are considered those that last longer than two weeks um, in adults and those that last longer than four weeks in children or, or adolescents. Um, and uh, that's it. If in doubt, uh, they also suggest consider referring to either a sports and exercise medicine specialist with, uh, with experience in managing concussions and return to, to play, uh, or if available, consider referring patients to a specialized concussion clinic as well. So lots of great stuff, Nick, in the, um, in the 10 articles there. And I think one of the things that I noticed was the um, importance of like the graphics and the, the actual things for implementing into practice that that seemed to be present in over half of the articles that were uh, regularly accessed by uh, your readers. Yeah, well, um, every year, Mike, we, we survey readers, a random sampling of readers. And uh, although the response rates are, are low as they are with most surveys that are done mm -hmm. these days, the numbers are fairly consistent. And uh, readers tell us that the kinds of things that they're interested in uh, reading in CFP to support them in clinical practice are clinical practice guidelines like the opioid use disorder ones that, uh, that you discussed earlier. They're interested in kind of short evidence-based um, clinical information that they can rapidly integrate into their practices like the tools for practice content and like the infographics. And so that's the kind of content that we're looking for and trying to provide for readers. And when we see it reflected in that they're the top most read for the, for the year, then, uh, then we, we know that we're on the right track. For sure, for sure. So just some quick housekeeping things. So submit your questions in the chat window. We have a few minutes to try and uh, weed through some of those. And then uh, don't forget that you have main pro uh, this is certified, so you can get name pro credits from this. You just need to complete the survey in the chat window. 
that survey closes Friday at 11.59 p.m. So you want to get it done by then. Most of you get it done far, far quicker, of course. Um, it'll still be available for viewing, but no longer certified, uh, the, the ones that aren't live. Um, although we're, we are building a website that's going to allow us to keep uh, these things as certified credits uh, for people to use as a library, et cetera. We've got some upcoming webinars that uh, we wanted to bring to your attention. They're again at Tuesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, and uh, it's uh, on September 29th. We're going to go through demystifying breast cancer with um, Dr. Anna Wilkinson. On October 6th, we're going to do some emerging issues with COVID. We, we did a strong series of COVID webinars. I think it was around 15 of them. Um, and we've moved on since then, as many of us uh, are not solely focused on COVID as, as we used to be. But um, we wanted to uh, bring back, because there's a couple issues. There's return to school. There's writing notes for not having to wear masks. There's things like um, seeing patients in practice who have respiratory tract infections and how do we, how do we manage that. So we'll bring back a team of uh, family doctors, public health people, that kind of thing, to chat about um, approaches to these issues, what's out there, what's being recommended, that kind of thing. October 27th will be the same uh, style of demystifying breast cancer um, with Dr. Jean Chapeau. That one will be in French. So that's what's coming up in the, the next month or so uh, for you. And don't forget um, the virtual uh, FMF this year, um, which was advertised at the start. Okay, um, now, uh, I think we're going to try and address some questions. I will uh, stop sharing my screen and go back. So uh, let me get to the questions. Um, and um, so what facts can family doctors give their patients to debunk information against vaccines that they find on the internet? And I think there was some of that in the article, but Nick, do you want to try and address some more of those kind of things? Yeah, I mean, I think the article does provide um, a lot of those responses and also links to where you can find those responses. Um, the um, And as I said, um, I highly recommend Ulibis's book on immunity. Um, when we published that article, I, I actually referenced that work um, in the editorial that I wrote to accompany the article uh, because she really sort of dives deep into many of the reasons, some of them that we actually may be unaware of or don't expect as to why patient or parents may be vaccine hesitant. And just being aware of some of those reasons can actually help us to, to address them. So uh, one that I was surprised by, for example, is, um, is people's concerns about the regulatory system and the safety of vaccines. Um, because patients are aware that there are lots of things that uh, are less well regulated um, than the process for assessing and bringing vaccines to market. Uh, as Eula Biss said in her book, if, if, uh, if other government systems for ensuring public safety were as stringent as those that are used to assess the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, then uh, we'd be golden. Um, so um, the article itself has has lots of that information and links. If you want to, uh, if there are specific questions that you're concerned about. Okay, the next uh, one of the next questions was around the shoulder. So uh, any idea of the percent of other risks with shoulder injections, like septic shoulder? So I, I don't know this for septic shoulder, but I do know the data for knees with corticosteroid injections. And I know I used to tell patients it was one in a hundred to one in a thousand, I was grossly wrong. Um, then when I actually looked up the data, it's uh, uh, higher than one in 10,000. So mm -hmm. the risk is exceptionally low of developing a knee infection from a joint injection from um, corticosteroids. But Nick, do, I, you might know, you might not, the, shoulder, the risk with shoulder injections. No, not really. Although, I mean, I'm thinking about one's clinical practice and the number of injections that we give, you know, in a busy practice, week in week out you know year on um it, it it's almost certainly very very low i think yeah but i'm not aware of any literature to uh to support that statement it's just based yeah. on clinical practice and observation yeah the only one that i've uh the only one that I'm, i've looked up before was the knee injections um another question was 
and and I think this person just needs reassurance because they were uh, they had a different belief system. So doesn't Ducrol work for um, e tech diarrhea, e t e c, enteric uh, enterotoxic, enterotoxic? Yeah, I mean not based, not based on Rudy Zimmer's review and and the evidence that's uh, available in the literature. No. Yeah, and it's interesting. Tools for practice um, also yeah. looked at this. That was Mike Colver years ago. And he also found that there was nothing to support uh, really using it for that type of diarrhea. It's very, very commonly thought of for that. And the marketing has been excellent uh, to drive patients to it. But the research is that it doesn't, one of the studies actually didn't even, it wasn't even designed like you would think. They actually waited for people to arrive. Uh, this was, I think, in Mexico. I think the country was Mexico. Yeah, and then great. started, and then started to vaccinate them. Um, so it was actually... Yeah. In my mind, um, yeah. So, uh, can the speakers comment on use of antibiotics for undifferentiated diarrhea? So, right now, the uh, just as that uh, guide uh, book, the infographic, or not guide book, but the infographic recommends um, for patients who are traveling, it's short courses, uh, one to three days of azithromycin, or I think some of the options are Cipro, some other things, um, but Zithro's first and to uh, give that for undifferentiated diarrhea because the only way for patients to sort that out on the road is to actually send it for, for yeah. testing, which is, which is impossible. And they, um, or, yeah, they, and they recommended azithromycin because of concerns about uh, drug resistance to cip ciprofloxacin. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, so especially in some areas where it's quite resistant. So that's... Uh, that's the approach and and the short courses are considered to be very low risk so that's that's kind of what um what's been recommended um someone asked um is asa 81 milligrams still beneficial in patients over the age of 75 with cvd um uh, so yeah so the question of you know should we be using it in patients with cvd i think that no, no one has rebutted that uh, with the clinical trial evidence. So if they've had an MI um, or stroke, those things are times where we consider. Now, there is so much data on dual antiplatelet combinations. Should you even be going to NOACs for some? It's it's getting only more confusing at the present time. But um, in, in where I practice and in other areas I practice, I haven't seen ASA come off the list. I don't think that's supported by the evidence. It's really around people who are at, at high risk, uh, or sorry, who you think might be at high risk. So if you look at, at 75 year olds without a history of cardiovascular disease, those patients were specifically studied. And I think it was 19,000 of them in Australia, and they didn't find really any benefit in those patients. So the consistent evidence is if you have a cardiovascular event, then ASA is on the table. And if it's, if you don't, you shouldn't be using it. And if you look at the risks and benefits of harms, if people are really interested in cardiovascular risk prevention, they should be looking towards a statin. It actually is um, far more effective, at least at least double and probably more than that. So we used to say around a 15% relative reduction for ASA. It's probably less than that, probably in the 7% range. And statins are somewhere between 25 and 35% relative reduction. So the differences are quite a bit bigger. I gave you relative there because relative is the only thing that can be transferred in that way. You can't you can't give absolute event rates because the populations are different. But uh, it uh, it just speaks to the fact that a ASA for primary prevention is really not on the table from any of the recent clinical trials. Um, one of the questions which I thought was was topical and Nick would be over to you is what do you think will be the uptake for a COVID vaccine when that becomes available? And what are some of the limits? Well, <laughs> hard to know where to start there. Um, I think one issue is going to be the issue of, uh, of safety and how quickly um, a vaccine is, is developed. You know, there's certainly talk in the US from uh, he who shall not be named uh, of rushing a vaccine through to be ready in time for the November election. And if that's the case, that's certainly going to uh, contribute to undermining people's trust in the vaccine um, development and assessment process. Um, so I think that's something to kind of bear in mind. 
But I think it's going to be many of the same issues that we see with vaccine hesitant parents for other types of vaccines. Um, maybe because of the huge impact that COVID-19 has had on every aspect of our lives, uh, uptake or vaccine hesitancy may be less of an issue. But I, I think the speed and being able to assure people about its safety and effectiveness is going to be really the crucial thing. Great. Thanks, Nick. I've got one more and then we'll uh, adjourn. But the last question was, uh, there are other questions and I'm sorry I can't get to them all. If you would like, you can definitely email me. Um, but uh, and it's mallen at cfpc.ca. And uh, the last question was around icosapent and are we advocating the use of icosapent? I don't know if I'd go that far yet. Um, it is relatively um, new and it's we're trying to figure out what its role is. The clinical trials to date have been positive. The small trial had about a 20% reduction. The bigger trial had about a 25, 30% reduction or something like that. And so these are bigger reductions than we've seen with a lot of other interventions. So where I would put it is it's the most promising uh, of the new interventions um, for cardiovascular risk reduction, it's, except maybe colchicine. Colchicine is an old drug and uh, we'll talk about that in an upcoming webinar, but there's some new clinical trials showing that it could be effective as well. So there's a couple of drugs where we, we go so long and people say about evidence-based medicine that we're always so negative <laughs> because nothing works. But the, the results are that some things really do work um, and there are some clinical trials coming out and icosapent is one of the interventions that is positive. So if you hear me and you're wondering, wow, he's really up for this. It's just because we've waited so long for drugs that actually work um, that uh, I'm impressed when it is. But uh, I'm cautious too, um, and I'm I'm waiting. I'm hopeful that there'll be better evidence, uh, a new new evidence to support uh, the one good trial, the one big trial. Okay, I think that's going to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Nick, for going through the the journal articles. We really appreciate it. Um, joining us on the on the Practical Talk series, and um, we'll have you, I'm sure, next year. And thanks, as always, for joining us. Please uh, check out the upcoming webinars, complete the main pro, and um, let us know if you have any questions. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.